This is Story Recapped. Today, I'm going to explain a fantasy horror film called The Mortuary Collection. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. A paperboy rides his bicycle and enters a mysterious town called Raven's End. At the end of his route, he notices that no one is collecting the papers outside a creepy house, so he decides to ring the doorbell. He peeks through the mail slot and takes a picture, startled to see an old man staring at him. The boy struggles to retrieve his camera since its strap is stuck in the slot. The town's mortician, Montgomery Dark, opens the door and greets him. When the boy runs away, Montgomery calls him back to get his camera, but the boy is too terrified to retrieve it. Later that day, Montgomery delivers a eulogy during a young boy's funeral. After the funeral, he notices a young lady trying to open the boy's coffin, so he stops her, believing that she might not like what she'd see. The woman introduces herself as Sam, and tells Montgomery that she's there to apply for a position at the mortuary. When Sam notices his extensive collection of books, Montgomery explains that they contain his client's stories. Sam prompts him to tell a story, so Montgomery narrates a tale set in the 1950s. During a party, Emma goes to the bathroom to take the money from the wallets that she stole from unsuspecting men. After dumping the wallets, she inspects a pocket watch and hides it in her bra. As Emma prepares to leave, she hears a thump coming from the medicine cabinet. Curious, she tries to pry it open with a nail file. She eventually unlocks the cabinet, but not without cutting her hand. While she tends to her wound, a tentacle closes the cabinet door. When she opens the cabinet again, she's horrified to find a tentacled monster inside, so she hurriedly closes it. Emma screams for help while trying to hold the door down, but no one hears her. When the monster stops moving, she tries to leave the room quietly, but the pocket watch falls out of her dress. Emma runs when the cabinet opens, but the tentacle grabs her. Emma's bones break as the monster pulls her inside. Sam remarks that the story is not bad, but she notes that it would have been better if it had a twist. Montgomery assures her that he has more stories, then asks Sam to sign a document to formalize her employment at the mortuary. Montgomery leads Sam to the foyer, where she sees several pictures of other morticians who served in the house. When they reach the viewing parlor, Sam asks Montgomery about the deceased boy's story, but he notes that some of the tales are just too unsettling to recount. Sam asks him to tell another tale, so he recounts a story set at a university in the 1960s. A handsome frat boy named Jake sets up a booth on campus to advocate for women's empowerment. He contends that the patriarchy is failing, and women can now sleep with whomever they please as long as they have protection. After distributing condoms, he quips to his frat mates, Todd and Connor, that they're helping impressionable and vulnerable women to fornicate with frat boys at their party later. When Connor sees an attractive and timid looking woman walk into her class, he offers her a condom. Jake interrupts them and tells Connor to distribute the rubbers to the school's non-existent lacrosse team. The woman, Sandra, notices that Jake doesn't look like a freshman, so Jake quips that he only shows up in the area so he can get laid. Jake is taken aback when Sandra confesses that she's there for the same purpose, so he stresses that he was only joking. Before returning to his booth, Jake invites Sandra to his fraternity's party. Sandra tells him that she might attend. As Sandra walks to her class, she passes by a billboard filled with photos of missing male students. When Jake sees Sandra arrive at the party, he immediately takes her to his room. As they make out, Sandra warns him that she could be a serial killer. Then she pushes Jake on the bed and strips off her clothes. Sandra hides something in her skirt before crawling towards Jake. As she sits on top of him, she tells him that she has something for him. When she shows him the item, Jake is disappointed to see that it's a condom. He reluctantly wears it, but Jake asks Sandra to turn around in the middle of their copulation. While Sandra is not looking, Jake secretly takes off the rubber and continues to fornicate with her. When Jake wakes up in the morning, Sandra is already gone. He discovers that she wrote her phone number in the mirror, so he wipes it off but most of the numbers are still visible. Jake suddenly feels something grumbling in his stomach, so he heads to the bathroom to throw up. Connor soon arrives and notices rashes all over him, so he advises Jake to go to a doctor. At the clinic, Dr. Harold Kubler prescribes him penicillin for the rashes, but he notices something odd in Jake's file, so he asks him to stay for further examination. When Kubler hears a heartbeat and growling in his abdomen, he asks Jake to wait for him and leaves the room. When Jake looks at his file, He's shocked to learn that he's pregnant. Back in his dorm, Jake takes a pill to terminate the pregnancy, but he just vomits after a few minutes. Jake decides to call Sandra when he sees his belly growing. He dials the wrong number a few times because he erased the last digit earlier. When Jake finally reaches Sandra, he asks her to meet him at her house. As he tries to leave the frat house, his fratmates stop him to celebrate his 67th sexual encounter. The Brotherhood considers a number 67 sacred because it represents their 67 founders. When they carry him on a chair to hang his name on the mantle, 
his water suddenly breaks and sprays onto his fratmates. Jake immediately drives to Sandra's house when his fratmates let him go. Upon his arrival, Sandra's father, Ralph, groans in frustration when he sees Jake's belly. His wife, Margaret, immediately calls Sandra and prepares to deliver the infant. When Sandra walks into the room, Jake berates Sandra for his pregnancy. Sandra, however, points out that he was supposed to be wearing protection. Jake apologizes and confesses that he wouldn't have been able to spend time with her years ago because he used to be fat. He notes that he strived hard to change himself, but his personality grew worse as his physical looks improved. Sandra looks at him with pity, but she walks away and calls another man to set up another date. As the fetus moves in his womb, he asks Ralph how the baby is supposed to come out. Margaret explains that it will come out the same way it got in. Jake screams in pain as the infant forces its way out of him. Jake's blood sprays all over the room after his reproductive organ explodes and rips his abdomen open. Margaret immediately pulls the baby out and takes it to the nursery. She carefully walks out of the room but accidentally steps on a whistle toy. The room fills with cries as all the babies inside wake up. One of them reaches its talons up in the air as Margaret runs out of the room. Sam is impressed with the tale because it has all the elements of a good story. Montgomery then takes Sam to the embalming room and shows her the corpse of a young woman. Sam remarks that the woman seems perfect, but Montgomery points out that her upper palate contains traces of magnesium, which is common for patients in catatonic states. Montgomery tells the tale of Carol Peters and Wendell Owens. During the wedding ceremony, Wendell seems happy as he puts a ring on Carol's finger. However, the church suddenly goes dark. Carol starts breathing heavily after the priest asks Wendell if he vows to love her until they die. When Carol screams at him, Wendell wakes up from a nightmare. Wendell hears Carol coughing profusely, so he goes to her room to check on her. Wendell sighs in despair, unable to do anything for his catatonic wife. When Wendell returns from the grocery one night, Mrs. Avery notices all the food he bought and brags about the meal she ate when she went on a cruise. As they wait for the elevator, Avery notes that she couldn't go anywhere when her husband was alive, but she can now go anywhere she wants after his death. When the elevator arrives, Avery goes inside, but Wendell decides to take the stairs. At home, Wendell prepares food for Carol by arranging vegetables, fish, and meat nicely on a plate. Then he puts them into the blender to make it easier for her to digest. When Dr. Kubler checks on Carol, he notes that she appears to be stable. Wendell asks how much longer she will live, so he discloses that Carol will survive for another year. Wendell is worried that he can't keep her alive for another year because of the bills. Kubler decides to leave him with some pain medication and hints that Carol could die if she takes two or more pills. When Wendell fails to get the hint, Kubler reveals that the substance doesn't leave a trace, and it's impossible to determine if Carol took too much of it. That night, Wendell dresses up for a candlelit dinner with Carol and gives her an arctic hair figurine. He asks Carol to show him a sign that she's conscious, but she just stares into space. Wendell slams his hand on the table in frustration due to her lack of response. He mixes the pills into Carol's food and feeds her. When Carol suddenly grabs his arm, Wendell realizes that she might be responsive, so he immediately takes her restraints off and pumps her stomach. Wendell is relieved after seeing her vomit, but her head falls to the table when he lets go of her. Wendell lifts her head, only to discover that she's been impaled on the figurine. Wendell contacts Kubler for help, but Kubler just tells him to dump Carol's body into the ocean. Wendell puts Carol's body inside her bridal chest, but she wouldn't fit, so he cuts her up. As he starts to chop off her thigh, she suddenly reaches for him and screams. Carol stops moving when Wendell pulls the figurine from her head. Wendell eventually manages to chop the body and fit it into the box. As he shoves the trunk into the elevator, a man tells him to hold the lift. But Wendell refuses to wait, so he forces the door closed, crushing his neighbor's hand. The elevator soon starts moving, but it suddenly stops before it reaches the ground floor. When Wendell tries to pry the doors open, Mrs. Avery arrives and offers to call the police. Wendell stops her and says that the elevator will probably move again soon, but Avery still insists on calling the police. When the elevator doors suddenly close, he notices that Carol's blood is leaking out of the box. Wendell tries to escape through the hatch, but he slips. Wendell throws his wedding ring in frustration. When the bridal chest suddenly unlocks itself, Wendell tries to open it, but the elevator starts descending. The elevator continues to descend even after reaching the ground floor. When he looks out the window, he sees a vision of himself and Carol living happily together. Carol's decaying corpse suddenly emerges from the box and puts his wedding ring on him before forcing him to kiss her. When the elevator opens, the police find Wendell sitting on the floor reciting his wedding vows while clutching his wedding album. Montgomery tells Sam that Wendell went insane and was committed to Kirksdale Mental Asylum. As Montgomery leads Sam to the basement, she complains that his stories are predictable because they themselves always involve people paying a horrible price for their sins. 
Montgomery stresses that it's a timeless message because no evil deed goes unpunished. As Montgomery pushes the boy's coffin into the cremation chamber, Sam stops him and confesses that she wasn't really applying for a job. She discloses that she's there to see the boy, Logan, because it's her fault that he died. Sam begs Montgomery to let her see the boy one last time, so he opens the coffin for her. Sam proceeds to tell Montgomery about the night that Logan died. While Sam babysits Logan, she watches a horror movie called The Babysitter Murders. When she goes to the kitchen, Sam sees a message on the answering machine. Dr. Kubler and his wife, Deborah, tell Sam that they might be coming home late, so they instruct her to make sure that Logan is asleep. Before hanging up, they tell Sam to fix herself something to eat if she's hungry. After checking in on Logan, Sam turns on the radio and prepares some food. Meanwhile, a reporter interrupts the movie to inform residents that a riot broke out in the asylum. The police advise citizens to lock their doors because some inmates might have escaped. When Sam takes out the garbage, she fails to notice the broken window by the door. When she gets back inside, she sees a man with a head wound in the living room, so she goes to the kitchen to grab a weapon. She gets a hold of a cleaver, but she drops it when the man turns up behind her. The man seems disoriented, so Sam tries to help him by cleaning his wound. The man grows agitated when the phone starts ringing. When the machine picks up the call, Deborah tells Sam to lock the doors because a psychopath known for mutilating kids has escaped from the asylum. When she sees his eyes gravitating toward Logan's toy, she puts the man's hand into the meat grinder. Sam attempts to hit him with the meat pounder, but he knocks her down with a kick. He slowly pulls his mangled hand out of the meat grinder before Sam gets up. Sam tries to stab him, but he blocks it with the chopping board. Sam continues attacking the man while he's screaming over the phone with Deborah still on the line. Sam bites off his ear, but he manages to slam her on the floor. The man goes to Logan's room, but the boy isn't there. Sam hurries to the boy's room when she hears the man screaming. Sam attacks the man with a fire poker while he hurls books at her. The man manages to slam her to the floor again and punch her several times before looking for Logan. Soon, the Kublers arrive but they can't get in because of the door chain lock. The man strangles Sam but she pleads with him by telling him that he's not a killer. The man gets up and tells her that it's over, but Sam pushes him down the stairs. The man regains consciousness and Sam drops a television on his head. When the Kublers enter the house, they recognize the dead man as the babysitter. The news reveals that the escaped inmate is a woman named Charlotte Gibbons, otherwise known as the Boggy Bay Tooth Fairy. Deborah panics after failing to find Logan. When they look inside the oven, they scream in terror upon finding Logan's remains. When Montgomery asks Charlotte why she came to the mortuary, she takes a tooth from Logan's remains and tells him that she needs it for her collection. Charlotte stabs Montgomery to keep him from telling her story. However, Montgomery just laughs at her as embalming fluid leaks out of his wound. He tells Charlotte that she got the job, but she runs away. Charlotte eventually reaches the door, but she ends up back inside the house when she goes through it. Charlotte finds herself in the library as she tries to flee from Montgomery. When he catches up to her, he discloses that he was once like Charlotte. He thought that he could escape from the consequences of his actions until he came across the house. As Montgomery stomps his cane on the floor, several books fall from their shelves. He remarks that Charlotte would be surprised to learn how many of the stories in the library are hers. The books soon open by themselves and several dark spirits of children crawl out of the pages. When one of the spirits bites Charlotte, she drops her tooth collection on the ground. She screams in pain as other spirits start attacking her. After Charlotte dies, a spirit grabs a tooth from the ground and puts it on. After putting Charlotte's body back together, Montgomery leaves the house. He takes a breath of relief after he steps outside, but he soon explodes into dust. Charlotte comes back to life inside the house and sees her hideous face in the mirror. Soon, after becoming the new mortician, Charlotte tells a story to the paperboy. When the paperboy attempts to leave, she discourages him from leaving by telling him that she's about to make dinner. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications. And leave a like it really helps the channel out. Thank you for watching.